everyone. Welcome to the Psychology of Music podcast. My name is Alex Alberti and today I'll be discussing some really awesome introductory concepts to music psychology as a whole. So the first thing we're going to talk about today is sound. Without sound, there would be no music. So what exactly is this physical phenomenon of sound? Sound is some type of disturbance of the air from a point of equilibrium and that disturbance will travel through some type of medium, typically the air, but it can also travel through something like water, for example. If you imagine what a sound wave looks like, imagine you drop a pebble in the water. Look at how the pebble displaces the water, how the water ripples as it moves across. That basically is what the physics of sound looks like. So air as a medium is elastic, which means it can come apart and then snap back together. Its molecules can be compressed and then pulled apart. So we can actually track the way this looks in a graph. On this graph, we have two different axes, time and pressure. When we're examining the way a wave interacts with the way we hear it, we look at a couple factors. The first is frequency, and the second is amplitude. If a vibration is slower, it results in a lower sound. If a vibration is faster, it results in a higher sound. In music, we're especially interested in waves that have a regular pattern of repetition. When a wave has a regular pattern of repetition, we say that it produces a definite pitch. It's a pitch you can name. And a definite pitch has a cycle of compression and rarefaction. One cycle of this is called a period. Waves that have periods are said to move in periodic motion. Waves that have periodic motion have a regular frequency. And when there's a regular frequency to the sound, it produces a pitch you can sing or match, a definite pitch. Other objects that don't produce regular periodic motion produce an indefinite pitch. You can't name that pitch. Typically, our ears can detect regular motion of 20 cycles to 20,000 cycles, though in reality, our hearing is more limited than that. The number of times a second that a wave vibrates is referred to as frequency. When humans perceive this frequency, we perceive what is referred to as a pitch. Typically, we measure pitch in a unit called hertz. A single cycle of a wave is measured from the crest of the wave to the trough of the wave. If frequency is the horizontal axis of the wave, the vertical axis of a wave is called amplitude. Amplitude is associated with the relative loudness of a sound. The deeper the sound, the louder, and the shallower the sound, the quieter. Something else really fascinating about sound and physics is that when you hear one pitch, you're actually not just hearing one pitch. You're hearing a series of pitches referred to as the harmonic series. The pitch you hear the most strongly is referred to as the fundamental, where the frequency, which is additive, is actually always happening above that fundamental frequency, producing what are called overtones. In fact, the reason instruments sound different is that they bring out these different overtones, thus creating the sensation of timbre. While the physics of sound is fairly complicated, luckily as human beings, we have built-in machinery that actually helps us decode all of these vibrations in real time, the ear. There are three primary parts to the ear, the outer ear, the middle ear, and the inner ear. The outer ear is primarily composed of just this, the pinna. The pinna helps focus and localize sound so that as humans, we can gather as many sound waves as possible and find out which direction they're coming from. That's what all of these folds and different divots help us do. Once vibrations are channeled from the outside world into our ear, they end up hitting this barrier called the tympanic membrane, otherwise known as your eardrum. As sound hits our tympanic membrane, it vibrates into our middle ear. Inside the middle ear are three bones called the ossicles. The ossicles are made up of the anvil, the hammer, and the stirrup. As our eardrum vibrates, it pushes these bones, which then in tandem push against our inner ear. Our inner ear has a barrier. As we push against that barrier with the ossicles, we displace what is called the oval window. The oval window is a small piece of tissue that leads us into the cochlea, into a fluid-filled inner ear area. Inside the inner ear is a spiral structure referred to as the cochlea. The cochlea has two separate channels, all filled with fluid, typically paralymph. 
As the vibrations are pushed into the inner ear through the oval window, this lymph causes the two canals to do what is called shear, or press against each other and create some tension. This tension activates hair cells on a lining called the basilar membrane. Once these hair cells are activated, they fire off an action potential, thus creating the sensation of hearing. Once transduction has happened from our inner ear to an action potential, it travels down the auditory nerve into our brains. Sound is processed in our temporal lobes, which are on the sides of our brain. And the auditory cortex, the part of the brain that generally perceives and works with incoming sound, is right on the outside of the cerebral cortex and then moves deeper into the folds of the brain. But how does all of this come together in hearing complex things in the world like music? Well, the first parts of this process take the basic parts of sound that we're hearing, like the pitch, the frequency, the rhythm, and it processes it in parts of our brain, like our auditory cortex and our brainstem. Once that happens, it moves into our secondary auditory cortex. In the secondary auditory cortex, we work with higher level thoughts like, hmm, I recognize this song, or where do I know this from? We put all this together and work with it on a higher cognitive level in the secondary auditory cortex. That leads us to a very interesting and complex part of music psychology called psychoacoustics. Psychoacoustics is largely responsible for understanding how humans perceive sound from our environment and take that and transform it into the experience of music. A great example of the complex way that our brains work to perceive pitch is what's called the critical band. In our cochlea, again, that's where transduction takes place, there are hair cells that line the basilar membrane of our cochlea. Each of these hair cells is responsible for detecting a frequency. When two frequencies are incredibly close together, whose frequencies are almost identical, we end up entering into what's called the critical band. When two pitches enter into this critical band, they end up conflicting with each other and creating this sensation or what are called beats. You can use beats in your music classes to hear if two pitches are out of tune. How does our cochlea know what pitch something is? Well, there are two primary theories. The first theory is called frequency theory. Frequency theory states that our hair cells fire with the same frequency of whatever pitch we're perceiving. Typically, this is done using a volley principle in which multiple hair cells take turns firing. The other theory is called place theory. In place theory, we assign each part of the cochlea to a different register of frequencies. The closer that they pitch is to the beginning of the cochlea, the higher the sound. The closer that a frequency is to the middle of the basilar membrane, the deeper the sound. What else is fascinating is that our pitch perception can even be better with more training. For example, conductors have much better pitch discrimination than the average listener might. Here's a question. What are the names of these two notes? This one and this one. If they're both A, what makes them different? Well, there are actually two different dimensions of pitch when we're naming and discussing them. Pitch height and pitch chroma. The name of a pitch, for example, A, would be that pitch's chroma. However, where that falls on the frequency in terms of how high or low it is would be the pitch height. If two notes have the same pitch height and pitch chroma, but they're played by different instruments, shouldn't they sound the same? Well, that brings us to our next topic of timbre. Timbre refers to the quality of a sound. For example, if an alto saxophone plays an A, but a clarinet plays an A, they actually sound different, even though they have the same exact sound-making mechanism. This comes back to what are called formants. And a formant has to do with the material of an instrument. As the different instruments are made of different types of woods or plastics or metals, it actually brings out different overtones in the overtone series, thus causing instruments to have their own unique sound. So now we've talked about how humans can individually think about and perceive things like pitch and timbre. But now how do we think about some of the larger scale things in music? Well, that brings us to the idea of music cognition. Music cognition talks about how we perceive music as a whole, how we take all of the disparate parts and combine them to make a meaningful, abstract experience as a human being. An overarching and important principle in all of psychology is called Gestalt psychology. Gestalt psychology focuses on how the sum of parts 
end up being greater than the individual parts themselves. Largely, Gestalt psychologists are very interested in the field of perception. For example, how do you perceive this image? Do you perceive it as a bunch of random letters or as an image as a whole? This is what Gestalt psychologists are mostly interested in. It's important in human cognition for us to take shortcuts in perceiving our environment. How exhausting would it be to have to individually pick out every single little part of an entire whole before we put it back together? Well, think about it this way. Think about all the individual parts of music, each note, each instrument, each rhythm. In the same way these principles might help us put together visual perception, music cognition researchers help us to find out how we piece together the parts of a whole piece of music. For example, look at this person playing the Moonlight Sonata. Then look at the sheet music. Wouldn't it be really complex if we had no idea how to pick out the melody from the background? Luckily, in Gestalt psychology, there is a principle called figure ground, in which human beings are capable of picking out the most prominent object that we're supposed to focus on. In this case, the melody against the background. Consider this scenario. You're at an orchestra concert, and at the very beginning, you hear everyone in the orchestra on stage practicing, tuning, and playing all at once. There's no semblance of organization. You're not sure what to listen to. It's just random people playing things. Luckily, human beings possess a capability called auditory scene analysis, where we're able to actually pick out individual sounds from seeming cacophony. This explains why we're able to derive some semblance of enjoyment from something as complex as a fugue. I bet if you try, you can pick out each individual voice from this complex texture. Another important facet of cognition is memory. Think about all the ways that memory plays into music making. Remembering fingerings, remembering key signatures, remembering what the first part of a piece of music sounded like in ABA form. In fact, the reason we're able to typically put together and understand music is referred to as statistical learning. Statistical learning states that the more frequently we're exposed to something, the better and more efficient we get at understanding it. It might explain that why we as adults are really good at recognizing major or minor scales in Western music, but might have a little more trouble understanding quarter tones in Eastern music. Constant exposure to music does more than just help us figure out major or minor. It actually lets us know what's about to happen next, or at least think we do. Think about the structure of human language. If I have the middle of a sentence go up an inflection, it usually means something's gonna follow it. The same thing happens with music. Think about the kid's song, Twinkle Twinkle Little Star. At the beginning of it, we hear it go up and end on G, the dominant. We're used to that being tense. So it not only resolves down, it actually fills in the gap left by the large leap at the beginning. This pitch reversal can also be called a gap fill melody. As human beings, we like how that works. We like that we can expect that those things will happen. Again, expectancy is a really important part of our perception of music. So as you can see, music cognition encompasses everything that involves our music listening experience, like our exposure to different sounds, the language we learned as we grew up, even our memory. I hope this video was an interesting and informative dive into music cognition, psychoacoustics, and music psychology as a whole. And I hope you learned something. Thank you.